Hi, my name is Brendan Cox. We are here at this studio in London where Uptown Funk and Adele and Nile Rodgers and all manner of wonderful things have been recorded. And today we are going to be recording some drums. We're going to bypass most of what's in the room to take a more simple approach and demonstrate how to record drums without a whole lot of gear to do that with. So we're going to do three different setups. We're going to start with two mics on the kit, then four mics, and then right up to eight to demonstrate three different approaches that you might take. We have a MacBook Pro and Pro Tools with an Arturia AudioFuse 8 Pre recording interface. The main challenge as an engineer recording a drum kit is that it is a very complex sound source with a lot of different individual sound sources comprising one overall picture and introduces all sorts of challenges and considerations. But if you work with good source material, that's kind of got you most of the way there. We're using all eight channels on this Audio Fuse 8 Pre, but if you wanted more than that, you could stick two together uh, and gives you up to 16, uh, which is a pretty uh, exhaustive amount of inputs to have for a drum set. Having a good kit that's tuned well uh, and played by someone that knows how to play it is kind of everything in, in the pursuit of a drum sound because there aren't really any recording techniques that can, um, can replace that. So yeah, tuning the kit and, and having, uh, having good equipment at the source is you know, fundamental to getting a good drum sound, whatever the drum sound is gonna be. The preamp plugins that we've got here are a very nice complement to an interface that records things very cleanly, especially when you have several to choose from because they give you a color palette that would be afforded to you by having you know, a room full of gear, but puts that in a laptop. It's a pair of Coles 4038s, which are, are ribbon mics. I tend to preference using them for drums in some manner or another. I think they are quite dark, which means that they help already with the amount of cymbal aggressiveness before you're even having to reach for EQs. And they have this sort of thud that I find quite sympathetic to snares, kicks, toms. So with only two mics to play with, I've got one up as an overhead, just in mono. I mean, the whole drum sound is mono. I mean, a lot of the coherency of kick and snare, you want them to be mono anyway. In a track, unless it's like a solo drum track, I find that most of the important stuff's gonna be straight down the middle. Cool. So I think it's one of the toms, probably the rack tom is ringing like crazy and it's just kind of like a drone over everything. So we might need to dampen that a bit. A lot of the sound is built off the front of kit mic. That's sort of doing the job somewhere between a kick outside mic and a room mic and an overhead. And it's sort of trying to get a overall picture of the kit with a fairly nice balance. The view would be to, I mean, we've just gone straight in, straight into the DW here, but the view would be to probably liven that up with some compression, some fairly heavy-handed compression, trying to get it in a position where you're going to be able to compress it quite a bit without the cymbals then ruining the recording. So it's, a, it's down a bit lower, trying to get more of the drums and the cymbals are coming more off axis to the mic. To me, just to my ears, it was sounding more like how I'd want to hear it, and that's a good starting point for the mic. But yeah, the, then a big part of that was looking at how we had the drums being, being treated. We've deadened them up quite a bit. It's quite a live sounding kit. Can we maybe just dry up the toms a little bit? I think in the, with the, how the kick and snare is sounding now, it's a bit, uh, they're a little hard and ringy. In the context of playing a sort of standard pop rock kind of beat, that can be a little much. So we've tried to tame that a little bit without killing the drums altogether, because you know you, I don't think you necessarily want the tom note ringing out for six seconds while the fill is over and back onto the next bit. So we've tried to bring that back a little bit. They're particularly, uh, in your face in that overhead mic. This one's singing.
Yeah, that's that's his photo. All right. The wonderful thing about the setup that we're working with is that it comes with these modeled preamps, which then, I mean, and they're low latency enough that you can track with these and listen back to them as though they were outboard preamps. We record everything really nice and cleanly, which means that it's a pretty good blank canvas to start to add other sorts of processing. So the, the V76 one here sounds really good. You know, when you drive it a little bit, it sort of saturates and colors the sound a little bit more, but it has these very basic EQs on it. Um, the high shelf is just really good. And especially when you've recorded some ribbon mics, which are by their nature on the darker side, they take that lift really well and you can get a bit of that, you know, sparkle uh, in, in the sound. And uh, this, is a, um, this is a great tool for that. Just uh, you can crank it all the way and it doesn't get harsh. It doesn't uh, start to hurt. And yeah, the, the kick drum was another big thing. It was quite, the beat that we had is quite uh, heavy on the attack and not in a particularly nice way. I don't think any of us thought. So I just put a bit of cloth over the batter of the kick to soften that a bit and simulate what you'd have. And that uh, immediately, the attack feels much nicer and blends in with the rest of the sound a lot more pleasingly, I think. It's a really dead room in there. Yeah, that's how the room's been designed and you have to work with what that is. So I guess a big sort of Led Zeppelin type sound wouldn't, that would be a lot harder to get in there. So with, with the, with only having two mics as well, there's not a lot of room to play with the room. Coles being figure eight, it is picking up some of the reflections coming back in it. So it doesn't sound like completely anechoic. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. I think we're there. Beautiful. I kept the front of kit mic, the same mic, the Coles 4038, where it had been in the previous one. I was quite happy with how it sounded. A lot of the work we'd done in the previous setup was to do with getting the kit itself to sound how we wanted it to, and that was all sorts of deadening and dampening and tuning, and we'd already done the legwork there, so. I switched the mono overhead for a stereo rib mic, an AER88, uh, which is just a stereo rib mic. I mean, you could do a four mic setup with, with mono overheads, but I just figured to try and get the most out of the kit, you get the opportunity to have a bit of stereo presentation. Uh, there are other things you can do with four mics, the Glyn Johns kit with the you know, one mic up, one mic to the side thing. I love the R88. It is a pretty quick way to a great overhead sound good phase coherency being X, Y, although sometimes I find it harder to center the snare because you're dealing with the axis and whatnot, but get the positioning right, you get a pretty good phase coherency in the sound and it just, like the Coles, they, as it's a rib mic, it softens the top end a little bit and gives you something back straight out the speakers that feels kind of nice. The fourth mic I added is a condenser mic. It's an AKG 414 in figure eight, and that sits under the snare, sort of in between the kick batter and the bottom of the snare. And it's just like a kick snare mic. And in figure eight, you kind of get the mic sort of equidistant from those two sources and then pick up uh, the slap of the batter against the kick. And then you, you get the rattle of the under snare. You know, typically with, you know, you might mic the bottom of the snare and this kind of gives you two things in one mic. You get a bit more bang for your buck, uh, the figure eight, pattern rejects really deeply towards the side. So you get quite an isolated kick and snare. The bottom of the snare can be a bit of an ugly sound in and of itself, but when you start blending it in with a top snare mic or what's above, you get a more complete sound of the snare. You can sort of blend to taste. Some snares. Phase is a massive consideration and because you can never have perfect phase with so many sound sources and so many microphones and it's just a case of listening and moving things around constantly flipping phase but and the, the more mics you get in you know with two as I said before it's quite easy you just flip one and you just find that it sounds better but once you're starting to bring more sources in you're sort of having to solo the different variations you know the kick snare with the overheads the overheads with the front and kick, the 
front of kick with the kick snare and be flipping and just find the best combination where everything sort of gels together. And you do feel it, you feel it as much as you hear it, the kit will just sort of fall into place a little bit more. I'm using the front panel of the audio fuse like it was a console thing. There's all the 48 volt phase pad switches are just there. So, and it's good to be able to do that with, uh, you know, you can do it with plugins if you don't have that readily available, but it gives you a lot more immediacy of just being able to like, you know, try the combinations out quickly and find that point where everything's feeling good. Better? Yeah. Cool. I then took the FET 47 off the kit, which sounded quite good where it was, and swapped it for the Roya, which was previously out in the room. Sort of doing somewhere in between. I really like that mic on the front of the kit, and if you angle it forward, the ribbon won't get damaged by the high SPL, but getting it back enough that, and again, because it's picking up from the back, it's getting a bit of the room, so, there's something to play with there as you sort of build the drum sound when you're looking at the tracks after being recorded that is getting something a little bit more ambient than what would have been available if I just kept that where it uh, was in front of the kick. There's a lot of different ways you can do this and a drum set is a pretty complex instrument and of all the things you record it's probably the thing that sounds the least like it does in real life on a recording because of the way focus is given on individual things. You would never listen to a drum set in that way and it's probably the thing that, yeah, it's kind of the most subject to unrealistic manipulation from, from what it sounds as an acoustic source. So yeah, there's like a million different things could be right or wrong given a context and recording it the way we've done today, it's, I'd say on the vanilla end, but for sort of the purposes of demonstration of how to pick up the certain sounds, I think that's kind of been an effective uh, way of just sort of getting a picture of what we have there in the room. This is a Canopus Vintage Series 5-ply uh, mahogany poplar with some maple re-rings, so it is designed to sound like the old classic Ludwigs or um, Slingerlands of back in the day. And as we got a 22-inch bass drum, 13, 16-inch toms. I believe this is a 5 by 14 steel snare, so we're going for a classic rock, big, open, fat, warm, kind of all the adjectives you want in a drum set. This already feels more at home for me. <laughs> yeah, it just feels like the the right choice. We got it taped up a little bit, not too much, so we're hoping it's punchy but still open and resonant. Let's see what happens. I don't know like exactly why it is, in terms of, like scientifically why those for small sizes tend to just have that hardness. I guess maybe they're meant to like be hit less hard. We're going for an eight mic setup this time. Our interface has eight pre's, so we're gonna max it out completely. Uh, with a bit more to play with, going for more close micing than we were doing before. So we've got something directly on the outside of the kick. It is a Neumann 47 FET, which is a nice luxury to have. I mean, a million people will tell you that that's a great mic to put there. It's got great low end response. We don't have an inside kick mic because I'm gonna use the kick snare combination that I did before because you know we've got eight, but still trying to keep things economical. They're all kind of roughly placed. We'll find a point where it sounds good. It might be better down near the hole. It might be better out the front. We'll see once we start playing. Tom mics, we've got these Austrian Audio OC18s. I love condenser mics on Tom's because you get a bit more top to bottom in terms of frequency range, um, and you get that the sort of depth of the Tom a bit more. It sounds good. Tom sound really good. Um, that snare is maybe a little extreme compared yeah. to everything else. At the top of the snare is a Sennheiser 441. Uh, it's a dynamic mic that gives you a little bit more of an extended frequency response than say a 57 mic and tends to just sound good in, in that role.
Is that better or worse? That is getting better. The overhead's back to the 4038s uh, in a space pair, which uh, obviously is giving us our stereo information on like when we had the mono one before. You do have to watch a bit more for phase and like center imaging when you're putting the mics like that, um, which is problem is they're gonna be the thing we have to play with the most. When we're finding a sound, just making sure that everything feels where it's meant to be and nothing's pulling to the left or right. But you know, with a bit of playing, that's pretty easy to get generally if you just measure with a cable the, from the center point of your kit and make sure that like that, that's a pretty safe way to at least get started. And then our last mic is a front of kit mic. Again, like we like I've done in both the other recordings. Uh, it's a Roya 121, which is, or R121, which is another ribbon mic. Um, given that we've got a lot of ability to get the close mic sounds and low end and whatever from here, um, this might move forward or back. It doesn't need to do the exact role that it was doing before, but again, it's just once it comes in, we'll see. But uh, given that we're not working in a big room that you know has a lot of reflections, we're not going for a big sort of spready, trashy room mic sound, uh, a mono front of kit mic, I think it's gonna work really well. Yeah, give me some time with like constant fills. When I first set up Tom mics, when Mike comes in, we, we have a hit, we'll listen to what these sound like and adjust accordingly. General rule of thumb is that the more on access to, the more you face it to the middle and on access to the where the stick's hitting, the more attack you're gonna get. The more you're facing it down towards the head of the drum, the more of the, the tone you're gonna get. That I tend to find is a good starting point on a bit of an angle just over the lip. I find if you get too down like that, it might sort of get a bit too ringy and resonant. Um, if you get too like that, you know, it's generally about finding that sweet spot, uh, but massively will depend on how the drum itself sounds. So I've kind of got them there because that's a good general purpose place to put them, where it'll sound vaguely like what the tom sounds like in the room and then adjust accordingly. That's a great unit. It's very straightforward, kind of straight out of the box. What you see is what you get. It just does exactly what you want it to do. It's very handy having everything right there on the front. As I was talking about before, playing with phase switches, playing with uh, pad switches, just adjusting the gain. It, having that at your fingertips allows you to just work a little bit quicker and be a little bit more reactive. Feels good. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. The pre's are super nice and clear. They uh, have like next to no noise. We were, you know, had it before and I couldn't even tell that the mics were actually working because turning them up wasn't giving me any hiss. You know, everything else in this room is decorative today. The entire session was run just off that and this laptop, which is, you know, you could fit it in a backpack, which is uh, super handy. Any one of these pre's will sound fine on any on any drum they're going to have different colors the sort of um, the sonic profile as you start to turn up the gain on them is where they really start to separate themselves it's a 1973 pre you can audibly distort a little more which if you have these sort of mics like the front of kit mic for example that isn't necessarily meant to be a clear sound is sort of supplementing what i have more discreetly mic'd up um you can get some very cool effects by driving that beyond what sounds natural uh, and it can sort of give a lot of sustain and you know aggression to the sound which blended in together makes it sound kind of more like you'd expect drums to hear on a record. Also comes with this FAT76 compressor. This is the kind of compressor I think a lot of engineers would um, favor on drums. It, the response of it is incredibly quick uh, and very well suited to the, you know, the, the snappiness, the sound profile of a drum set and you can do everything from control things to make them beyond recognition. Also comes with this delay plugin, the Tape 201, which is a great creative tool. Could find a place on drums, but on a million other things, it sounds uh, wonderful. 